You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 29, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, eosinophilic esophagitis. Our presenter is Megan Ayuni. She's a fifth-year medical student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick overview today for eosinophilic esophagitis, and um, we'll just start. Go ahead. Oh. You just click the arrow. See right. the right arrow? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is just a basic overview definition from the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Um, it's basically a chronic immune antigen-mediated disease, and clinically you're looking at symptoms related to esophageal dysfunction, and histologically um, you're looking at eosinophil-predominant inflammation. So clinical manifestations, you know, what are your patients going to come in with? And sometimes it can be something as severe as a feeding dysfunction, food impaction, or they might just have abdominal pain, vomiting. Um, the symptoms can range on a very large scale. <coughs> so just looking at um, some of the epidemiology, this has um, been an incidence, has been increasing over the past several years, and actually now it's being reported in several countries. And um, it is there is some sort of possible regional variation, um, primarily in the northeastern states and a lower prevalence in the western states. Same thing, higher prevalence in um, urban areas versus rural, and an increased incidence as well in cold areas versus tropical zones. And interesting enough, I was looking at some of the articles, and they show that the majority of children affected tend to be boys. And we're looking at adults, men in their 20s or 30s. And there's a lot of research that is going on right now looking to see if there's some sort of variations in a gene located on the X chromosome that can make people more susceptible to this disease. So looking at causes, um, I'll get more into the pathophys of it, but as of now, the exact cause is not completely understood. We do have an overview, a basic idea, but we obviously know that it includes some sort of environmental and genetic factors. And um, just in a nutshell, kind of for the pathophysiology, we're looking at an adaptive T cell immunity. And this is driven by your type 2, your T helper cells. And we're looking at major interleukins like IL-13, IL-5, IL-15, and this peptide called eotaxin, which expressions of these are thought to play a major role. And I just have up here just a picture of the eosinophil, what you might be looking for in a slide. Remember that you're looking for something that's going to stain red. Uh, bilobe nucleus, and just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so when we're looking at this disease process, we know that it's normally eosinophils are not found in your esophagus, and that there is this link between uh, this disease and allergy. So a lot of this is a recruitment process into your esophagus. And um, specifically, looking at this peptide eotaxin and IL-5, some studies have shown that in the absence of eotaxin, that you actually notice this eosinophil recruitment was completely destroyed. It was ablated. And when you didn't have IL-5, for example, or um, eotaxin, the same thing is that you saw a gradual loss. So obviously, they play a very large role in, role in this recruitment process. And then for something like IL-13, they have done intratracular which has been shown to induce inflammation by a mechanism that's dependent on the interleukins, IL-5, that I just talked about. So all of these are pretty much interconnected. And you can also see that with something like IL-15, that activates T cells to produce cytokines that act on the eosinophils. So um, looking here, this is just a very basic diagram that I found. But you have food allergens, just kind of looking at the bottom pathway. And those are going to stimulate your T cells. And like we just talked about, you have IL-5, which is going to stimulate your bone marrow, for example, to increase eosinophil production. Then you have IL-4, IL-13, that um, you're going to see stimulation of your epithelial cells, your smooth muscle cells. That's going to release the eotaxin, stimulate your eosinophils. And that's how you get this infiltration into your esophagus. 
So um, it's important to keep in mind that even though eosinophils do play a very large role in the inflammatory process, you do have things like your mast cells, your Langer hand cells that also contribute to this disease process. So as with anything, a differential is always important just to consider. And often for this disease, it's very often confused with GERD, a lot of times just on the clinical presentation, because patients will come in complaining of acid reflux, of abdominal pain. So we'll get into this with the treatment plan a little bit. But before you diagnose, you want to always try maybe a one to two month treatment trial with a PPI, just to see if you could rule that out. And then once you go further to biopsies, you'll see things like increased basal zone hyperplasia. That's going to be very prominent. You might see some papillary lengthening. And these will all help confirm your diagnosis for um, this esophageal uh, disease instead of thinking more along the lines of GERD. And then, of course, you have Crohn's disease, you know, celiac disease, drug injury that can cause similar presentation and symptoms. And like we just talked about, so one to two months treatment with a PPI should first be used. Then you might consider an upper endoscopy, have esophageal biopsies to take a look. And then um, just as more general radiology, you might want to look at just to make sure there's no anatomic um, malformations or abnormalities. And like with anything, lab testing here can be helpful. So you want to check the CBC, look at your eosinophil count, also look at your IG levels. It's important to keep in mind that even though about 50 to 60 percent of your patients might test positive for the IG, you can still have this disease even though um, you might have normal IG levels. And then there's the skin prick and patch testing, which people might be familiar with. But um, we'll get more into that, the treatment. But that's very helpful when you're looking at um, using this to find selective foods that might be triggering this. And then using what we'll get to is you know, an elimination diet, direct elimination diet, and see, OK, do my symptoms or does the patient's symptoms approve using that? So this is just a sample example of um, what you might see on a slide in a patient. And just going over the 2011 guidelines from the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, um, when you are looking at it clinically, you want to have, obviously, some sort of symptoms of esophageal dysfunction. And then as far as pathology, you do want um, one or more biopsy specimens that must show eosinophil predominant inflammation. You also, with a few exceptions, you want approximately at least 15 eosinophils as a minimum value in order to make this diagnosis. And then um, obviously these diseases isolated to the esophagus, and you want to be able to rule out other causes. And then lastly, like we just talked about, your disease should at least remit or so show some signs of resolution when you do have dietary exclusion or use topical steroids or even both. So when we're looking at um, these findings, we can see when you do an endoscopy, stack circular ring strictures. Um, here's an example of, you know, this might be in someone that's more severe, has a more progressive disease, ultimately can lead to strictures. But this is just something that you want to look at um, and keep in mind. So lastly, we're just going to come to treatment. So dietary therapy is something that has been proven to be pretty effective. And in a pediatric population, I was reading about how it is often preferred than using these steroids long term. So there was a retrospective study in one of the articles I was reading from the Cincinnati Center of Eosinophilic Disorders. From, and they followed a group of children from 1999 to 2011. And um, these, they just evaluated the three types of dietary intervention that can take place. And they looked at an elemental diet, an elimination diet, and a direct elimination diet. So the elemental diet is where you eliminate basically all your foods. And you have this amino acid kind of substance for complete nutrition. And then an elimination diet is where you look at the six more, most common types of foods, like eggs, peanuts, milk, whatever you most commonly can cause allergies in patients, and um, you eliminate those. And then dress elimination is based more on the skin prick and the patch testing that can be done, and you eliminate those specific foods. And I just thought it was interesting. So they came to a conclusion that the diet ther therapy is effective, and they did find that an elemental diet, so removing all of these foods, is more effective than restricted diet therapies based on skin testing. Um, and then just 
a couple pharmacological therapy, like I said before, acid suppression, this can just help with symptom control. And um, topical glucocorticoids have been, I guess, being used is what I've been reading about. And a lot of times these are actually, rather than being inhaled, they're called swallowed inhaled steroids. And so you basically don't use this as an inhaler. You don't want to inhale. You just swallow it, and um, it's sprayed instead. And you instruct your patients to not eat anything for you know, about 30 minutes. And then you have budesonide, for example, which has been research right now for maintenance therapy, they're thinking, because a lot of doctors don't want to put their patients on long-term steroids because of the side effects, but it's something that's still being looked into. And then lastly, if you don't have any other options, if your patient's not responding to any of these, and they do have you know, increased esophageal dysfunction, they do have strictures, and you can consider more of a procedure like our last point there. So just lastly, to quickly summarize this, um, Obviously, this is to the left. You can just see um, examples of with your treatment as an elemental diet using topical steroids, you're actually eliminating the act source of the inflammation. And that's really important because our ultimate goal is we don't want this chronic inflammation that will lead to scarring and fibrosis. And uh, that can be very helpful in the long run to ensure that your patients don't have problems. But <clears throat> Great. Very good. my references, and thank you. That was just a quick overview. <laughs> Interestingly, we have to teach people to swallow their inhaled steroids. Most of our patients do that anyway, don't they? <laughs> so we just have to tell them to do what they've been doing with Dr. Spacer, and, yeah. and they'll treat their esophagitis. Too. Maybe the asthmatic should have less esophagitis <laughs> because they're already swallowing the inhaled steroids. <laughs> it's a really bad disease, I don't think it's an honest disease because, um, you know, you're saying that patients should go on an elemental diet, at least that's been suggested as the most effective yeah. treatment, and yet you have to eat food. Right. No, I agree. <laughs> so you have to eat something, and so that then it's a quality of life issue. Which is yeah. worse, eating the elemental diet or having the esophagitis? And I suppose if it leads to strictures, that's one thing, but it doesn't do that for most patients. Yeah. If there is a way of predicting which patients may be a little discomfort is worth being able to eat normal food. Cause that really is a significant uh, quality of life issue. It's a balance between the burden of disease and the burden of treatment. Mm -hmm. And that balance always has to be considered. From a medical perspective, we're always saying what works to treat the disease, and you treat it regardless. And from a patient perspective, I'm saying, I'm thinking, well, but do I really want to treat it? Or maybe I can live with it and not treat it so aggressively because I like to eat food. Right. I remember looking at some of those studies, and because the elemental diet is not palatable at all, some of those kids actually need NG tubes. To yeah, so you want to live your life with an NG tube? Yeah. yeah. Gag me with or the tube, <laughs> you know? Man. Uh, I mean, that was... That's hard to swallow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to a little GI cord. He down his esophagus, and he couldn't get the fuse completely down, and he was at a point where it was so impacted that he was just, like, spitting up his own saliva, and then they did the biopsy, and he had EE. And he was like a 14-year-old kid, and he'd just been living like this for wow. years and years. And you know, it's like, well, I try to chew my food as much as I can, but now I just can't do it anymore. Uh, like, oh, my God. What a wretched life. Yeah. <laughs> it was... I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. This was really great. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to shift gears now. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.